I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. We call it classroom etiquette. It's a Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And you can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. How do you deal with it? Confession of sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. And what that cleansing does is work for sanctification, brings you back into fellowship with the Father uh, spiritually. I'm not talking about relationship, I'm talking about fellowship. So I give you that moment. Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for the privilege to step before you the throne and offer prayer that the Holy Spirit will give unction to with clarity to the needs we present like Jake we lift him before you father and pray you put your healing hand upon him and and uh, and in doing that reveal to him the lessons that's necessary in the spiritual realm for his life it's not about a physical thing it's about how we can come out of this and have an attitude of praise to God and we pray for Ava anytime we're dealing with a four-year-old. Our hearts always go out to them and, and to the mother and probably the grandmother here uh, to give them comfort, encourage them, be with that little girl as she has to go through some medical treatment to get her arm healed. And so we pray for that. We pray for Pete as he's back home now and uh, needs uh, a good retirement area to live with and at least the family thinks that a good place would be uh, the VA retirement center up in Pell City. Uh, if there is another place that would be adequate sooner, we pray to be revealed. We also pray, Father, for Horton. He's out uh, ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for him for strength and for clarity, for open doors, open hearts, ears, all the things that are necessary, Father, for the sowing of the word of God. And uh, we pray for William tonight. We pray, Father, you put your healing power upon his life, upon his lungs. And again, Father, we pray for healing and for praise that we might, might encourage the fact that this will be for the glory of God. And so we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll open your Bibles to Acts 1, 4, and 5, chapter 1. Um, we're in a discussion on the baptisms of Jesus, and we've been looking at four of them, and I've kind of stopped because of the awesomeness of it. I've stopped. Uh, we've stopped and did several studies on, on Jesus' bab baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is another one of these lessons that come from it because Jesus kept saying to his disciples, um, that the baptism, his, Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit was connected to what was called the promise from the Father. The promise from the Father. So I want to show you the, uh, the clarity of that and the connection of them tonight out of Acts 1. I'll show you many places, but my text tonight is Acts 1, 4, and 5. This is just prior to his ascension. You know, when you're talking about the ascension of Christ, we're, we're looking at Acts 1, 1 through 11. So when I drop into verse 4 and 5, we're in the, the pr processing now of him going to the ascension in verse 11, 9 through 11. And, and it, it talks about in verse 4 and 5, and gathering them together, that is his disciples, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. And then he identifies it, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptizes with water, 
but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he's connected these two things. Jesus himself connected them. Do you see that? He connected those. And so I want us to pay attention to this promise from the Father that he's talking about that's connected with him baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Not him being baptized, but him baptizing with the Holy Spirit uh, that he talked about a great deal in John 14. Well, in the upper room discourse. So when I, at the very top of your page, I put Acts 1-4. So I want you to look at it and I want you to circle a couple things. The first thing is he commanded. This is a, a word, perangalia. Uh, uh, angelio, and it's, a, it's an aorist active indicative. And this word is kind of interesting. It's, it's commands. He commanded. He commanded. And this word in the Greek language means to pass on an important announcement. It's kind of interesting that it's translated I mean, normally this would be the word, I want to make a declaration, I want to declare, I want to announce something of importance to you. So it's kind of interesting that the English translation, I don't know what the King James did on verse 4. Commanded. 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 Okay, well, they all stayed with that idea. Uh, but he's got, and that's, and that's probably why they use that word that way because it was to make an, a very important announcement. Um, uh, and here it was. It has two parts. Now, I want, you, the, the, I want you to circle two more things. He makes, here are the two things that are very, that were, he felt was very, a very important announcement. It has two parts to it. It has a negative and a positive. Watch the negative. Not to leave Jerusalem. See that? And the positive, but to wait for what the Father had promised, and then he explains that in verse 5. Agreed? All right, so there's a, and, and this is just prior to his ascension, okay? So what I see him doing here just prior to his ascension is giving what he called two commands or what's called two commands, a, a negative and a positive, right? Two commands, which I see as his directive will to these disciples. I see this as the directive will to these disciples, one a negative and one a positive. And then he adds, which you have heard from me. In other words, he has, he has spoken to them on this matter a great deal. <clears throat> and then he explains it in verse five, right? He said, John, John introduced this, and then I've been pushing it ever since. <clears throat> okay. When you remember when we're in Acts, the author of Acts is Luke. Luke, at Luke the book of Luke is volume one, and Acts is volume two of the two books he wrote. <clears throat> what is interesting is that when you look at the books of the New Testament and who wrote what, you know, you got Paul, he writes 13. You got John writes five. Peter writes two. Luke writes two. But you know what? When you put the two, bo the two books of Luke up to everybody else, you will find that he swallows them. If you, if you look at the number of pages, like 70% of them come out of Luke and Acts. That's amazing to me. I mean, they don't look that big, but they're pretty heavy as far as the number of words and information. It's just, just one of those kind of interesting things. You look, these kind of little two books, and yet the, the, not just the substance of them, but the, the amount of information that's delivered from them as far as the amount is kind of overwhelming. Well, anyhow, um, in, my point was in Luke 24, 49, he, he mentions this 
uh, this promise of the Father. He says, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father. Now, see, he's in that, when you read Luke 24 and you're in verse 49, you're in the same, you're in the, you're in the same period just prior to the ascension that we are when Luke opens up. Are you with me? Yes. <clears throat> and he says, Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. <clears throat> and, of course, that's going to be Pentecost, Acts 2. And that's where Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we studied that that's more than just one event in the book of Luke. In fact, it covers four phases. So tonight I want to look at four ways. <clears throat> I originally had five, and then I went back and looked, and I had reduced it to four. The lesson tonight is going to look at four ways. The promise of the Father is the same as Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> That's my point. Uh, in, in Point number one. In Acts 1.5, Jesus says, <clears throat> he says to them, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he adds this wonderful thing, not many days from now, right? Not many days from now. And, and it's going to be based on his ascension because we're in the ascension passage. When we're at the end of Luke 24, we're in the ascension passage. When we're in the first part of Acts, we're in the ascension passage. Okay, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When he ascends back to the Father, seated right hand of God the Father, it's going to be 10 days. We know that historically because that's when Pentecost comes. You remember from the resurrection to Pentecost, it's 50 days, and he was resurrected according to Acts 1 at the 40th day. He, 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 he ascended on the 40th day. Not many days from now, uh, will occur after Jesus' ascension and session. It will begin at the Feast of Pentecost, 10 days from Acts 1, 1, 1 through 11. We have learned what we have learned so far in this study, not tonight's study, but previous to this. We have learned that Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit has four phases in the book of Acts. Acts 2, Jewish believers. Acts 8, Samaritan believers. Acts 10, 11, Gentile believers, and Acts 19, the dispersed disciples of John the Baptist at Ephesus. Paul picked them up on his third missionary trip. When you get into Acts 19, you're into Paul's third missionary trip. We have also learned the divine purpose of Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit was to incorporate, to incorporate Jewish age believers into the body of Christ and to establish the church of Jesus Christ in the world by the end of the book of Acts. That's the power of these two volumes that Luke wrote. They're enormous volumes to the establishment of the coming of Christ and the establishment of the church in the world. When you read 1 Corinthians 12, we take it for granted that the church is well established when he talks about we are baptized into the body of Christ. And then in verses 1 Corinthians 12, 20, 12 through 24, he talks about how each of us are gifted in the body of Christ. Some of us are eyes and ears and legs, but one body, different gifts and ministry. By, by 1 Corinthians 12, this is an established when they refer to the church, they're not talking about some kind of assembly. They're talking about the body of Christ in the world. That's really important. For example, in Ephesians 5.23, at Ephesus, where he picked up the disciples of John the Baptist, this is written back to him. For the husband is the head of the wife, listen to this, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Right? 
Well, when did this get established as such in the world? The book of Acts. It's well established by the end of the book of Acts. Because the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, Paul has already gone to the utter, uttermost parts. He is out there as the apostle to the Gentiles. He's out there whacking it. So this is kind of an important thing that some of the missing things that you need to know about, about church history is, is right there. The second thing that I find important about the Father's promise, we learn from, from the Jeru Jerusalem Pentecost of 30 AD. You remember that's a Jewish holiday now. Remember that when we talk about Pentecost, we're talking about a Jewish holiday that's described to you in Leviticus 23. We learn from the Jerusalem Pentecost of 30 AD, that's Acts 2, that the promise of the Father was attached, listen to me now, to the Messianic prophecy of Joel 2. Now, I want you to go in your Bibles, roll over there to Acts 2, where we have Pentecost. At the day of Pentecost, you see it, verse 1, and when the day of the Feast of, of Pentecost had come, Right, We have that identity. Then you drop down to like verse 16. And, and Peter in verse 14 stands up, uh, who is one of the apostles now of the 11 in verse 14. And, and he speaks uh, to the men of Judea. In, in uh, verse 16, he's talking about the experience of what they have had at Pentecost where they had, Jesus had baptized with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with tongues because we're Jewish here. But listen, this speaking with tongues is going to be important all the way through the book of Acts for the reason of incorporating people in, in, the, in, the, in the Jewish age concept into the body of Christ. Uh, but this was spoken, look at verse 16, but this was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now, he's going to go through 17 through 21, which is Joel... 2, 28 through 32. If you have a study Bible, you'll see it in a, in somewhere in your, in your references, right? Yeah. You, you're going to have that identity, right? Now, I wanted to put this on your paper for you to look at sometime in your own personal study. Notice that the Feast of Pentecost, which, which is described in Acts 2, goes back to Leviticus 23, 15 through 17, where it is given how it should be done, what day of the year and how it's to be celebrated. It was to be a national holiday, okay? Uh, this was established by Moses, now listen to me, in the 15th century B.C., right? And listen, it's going to be fulfilled. It's going to be kaput after Acts 2. It, w w actually, after the, after the book of Acts, kaput. Now, the, Jewish holi the Jews are going to celebrate this holiday until the fifth comes. But the, let me tell you, Pentecost was about Jesus Christ. It's shadow Christology. What about Pentecost is about the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why it's connected, the way it's connected to Joel. See, he's quoting, at Pentecost, he quotes Joel. He doesn't quote Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zacharias. The, he doesn't do that. He, he quotes Joel. He quotes Joel. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit was the first phase. Listen to me now. This is what's important. Why did he pick up Joel and attach it to Pentecost? Because it is the coming of the messianic age. Jesus Christ coming into the world was to bring the messianic age. That's what they were looking for. That's what John the Baptist come preaching. Jesus' the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the first phase of the messianic age of the prophecy of Joel 2, 28 through 32. Joel is recorded in the ninth century BC. And this prophecy, because of the coming of the messianic age with Christ, Joel is important 
And Joel 2, 28 through 32, involves both the first coming and second coming of Jesus Christ. The difference is that in the Old Testament, there wasn't a separation between the first and second coming. It was just the coming of Christ. What separates the first from the second coming of Christ is the mystery of the church. You and I, we believe in a first and second coming because the church separates them. What's going to happen when the church leaves the earth? We're in the second coming of Christ, right? We're in the second coming. Until then, we're in the first. But in the Old Testament, from start to finish, it was just the coming of Christ. And that was the coming of the Messianic age. And that's where a lot of the disciples were getting confused because the Messianic age, they thought, was the end of this deal, which was the, the, the millennial age. And so they were confused about it. People are still confused about it. Remember that in the Old Covenant, there was no concept of first and second. Joel is a classic example of this principle. When you, and, and I want to show you some things. I want to show you some things that are really neat. I want you to hold the place of for Acts 1, and I want you to go find the book of Joel. Now, it's, it's one of the minor prophets, right? One of the minor prophets, Joel. You know, Hosea, Amos, Amos, Hosea, Joel. Okay? Uh, Joel, the second chapter, we're going to look at verse 28 through 32. All right? Let me get 28. All right, do you have that? Yeah. I'm going to read it. Here's what 28 says. And it will come about after, after this that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. Are you with me? I want you to turn over to, look, to, over to Acts. And, and, and when we get to verse 17, we're, we're, we're quoting. Agreed? Oh, is it the same thing? Is verse 17 the same thing? Not my Bible. Verse Acts, Acts 2.17. It shall be in the last days, saith the Lord God, that I will pour out. Look. No, they listen, that's added because it's bringing it into historical reality. Right? It's not in Joel. It's a footnote to Joel in Acts 2. Please tell me you see that. What were they saying there? That's the Messianic age. You understand that? Last days. That's well understood. We're in the last days when Christ comes. We're, we're in the last days. And listen, the last days from, the, from a concept of the old covenant is first coming, second coming, but they didn't talk it that way. But that, see, that's a footnote, isn't it? Okay, it shall be. I, I don't. Mm, no, it wouldn't mean that. But that's what they. That's how they interpret it, Rick. That's exactly in the New Testament how they interpret it. Interpret it. It shall. It will. It will come about after this, and that's the coming of the Messiah. Right. Right. Talking about the Messiah. Right. Being here. Yes. So then it says, and, and afterwards. Yes. Meaning after the Messiah. A, a, after his coming. Right. Yep. But see, they put a technical term that we all know. When they say last days, we know what they mean. Yeah. Okay? So that's a, and I'm just showing you that's a footnote to that. that that's, a, that's an explanation to the church. That's an explanation. Listen, we're relating this to the New Covenant people. This is New Covenant talk. 
and then and then and then he goes through this. He goes through this, and then um, uh, l- let's look at verse thirty-two. Right. So uh, on your paper, I made mention of this. Look, I said last day should be compared with Joel, right? And then Joel 2.32 compared with Acts 2.21. So let's see how, we, how they close this out. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered, you see? And when we come, when, and, and delivered is the same concept as saved, when we come over here to 21, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you see how that's working? It will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. And, and he's talking about now a concept over here in deliverance, which other guys took a different way. Well, he's going to deliver us from Joel, you know, they're going to deliver us from oppression and issuing of the kingdom and all that business. This is where they, that's not why Christ came. Actually, the word saved is why he came, right? I mean, if there's not a first coming where he's this, that, listen, he's not only the Lord of the body, but he's, a, he's the savior of it, right? And so this is a, 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 a very big deal. A very big deal, okay? A very big deal. Um, and it's, it's, it's now we're into interpretation, a new covenant interpretation of a messianic prophecy. Joel 2, uh, 28 through 32, is a messianic prophecy. Agreed? Yeah, it's, it's connected to Christ and his coming. And not only that, it's connected specifically to Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. To the saved of the Jewish age who are going to be incorporated into the body of Christ before his second coming. So Joel, when, when you read Joel and then you come back and read, for example, if you read the rest of Joel, he's going to talk about the second coming. He's going to talk about, in verse 19, he's going to say, and I will grant wonders in the sky above and the signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. Let's talk, that's the day of the Lord coming is the second coming. But you see, Unless you understand that in the old covenant, they, they, there wasn't the church that separated the first from the second coming. Then that makes sense to you. It's important that you, because of new covenant believers, you have a sense of the difference of what's going on here. Therefore, the Joel passage in Acts 2, 17 through 21 covers both the first and the second coming of Christ. Agreed? Yes. Point number three, what the Jewish believer, Jewish age believers, what the Jewish age believers experience in Acts 2 will be the pattern for the Samaritans, Gentiles, and the 12, 12 disciples of John at Ephesus. Now, I want you to pay special attention to me. Anyway, this is where you can't be a casual reader with me. You've got to pay attention. I'm going to walk you through this thing. And how many times do you think you're going to have to read this and look at this before you understand it? Maybe 10. William says 10. At least three. At least three. Okay. Now, let me walk you through it. Remember I said, and the key from, listen, the key, key word from Joel to Acts 2. Now, pay attention is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. We know from what Jesus said in Acts 1, 4, and 5 
that the pouring out was Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Agreed? That's why it's there. Come on. I don't mind working for, for my lunch, but okay. So we're going to pick, we got to pick up the Jewish age believers, Samaritan, which are going to be Jewish age. See, all these are going to be Jewish age believers, Jewish age believers. They're going to be Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, and the diverse, the dispersed disciples of John. But there's a pattern and the pattern's what's important. I want you to see this because it's incorporating these people into the one church, the one body of Christ on earth. And this is a great mystery and it's, it's unique and different. Now, the Jewish age believers in Acts 2, 4. Okay. And they were all filled. Here's what it says. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. All right. As the Holy Spirit was giving them utterance. This is unique and it was prophetic. All right? This was prophetic for the Jew. It's going to be prophetic for a lot of people in this because we're incorporating Jewish age believers, Jewish age believers, which are composed of Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, and disciples of John. The Samaritan believers you can read about in Acts 8, 14 through 19. Here's verse 17. And when they, Peter and John, who have apostolic authority in the church, by the time we get to Acts 8, this is identified in your Bibles in Galatians 2, 8 and 9. Three pillars of the church with apostolic authority was Peter, John, and James. When they, Peter and John, apostolic authority, began laying hands on them, they were receiving the Holy Spirit. This was discussed by Jesus before his ascension to his disciples in John 20, 21 and 22. John 20, 21 and 22. Okay? Now, again, you're going to have to go and do some study on yourself. I'm just looking for similarities that you need to see. The Gentile believers come along in Acts 10 and, ver and Acts 10 and 11 chapters. All right? So, so far we've got Jewish believers and we've got some Samaritan believers all out of the Jewish age. Are you, do you understand that? All out of the Jewish age. All these believers were converted in the Jewish age. Gentile believer, we're with Cornelius. You remember he's, he's the Roman centurion. Okay. What's interesting is that we've got two different locations. God is on long distance call with two different geographical locations with people. On the one hand, he's at Caesarea with Cornelius and with Peter somewhere near Joppa. You know why Joppa is important in this story? Anybody know anybody famous that came out of Joppa and got on a ship? Jonah. This makes it kind of interesting reading. Now, God is working long distance on both these, a long distance call with both of them. Agreed? If you know the story. All right. I'm looking for common ground about the baptism of Jesus. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. All right. So we've seen a similarity here. It's called the pouring out. And I remember, watch this now, this is important. And I remembered the words of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See there? See that? Therefore, if God gave them the same gift in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way. That's the 11th chapter, 15 through 17. See what's going on? We're still talking about this that we were talking about in Acts 1-8. We're still talking about it, and we're in Acts 11. We have picked up three groups of Jewish age believers, 
We've picked up Jews. We've picked up Samaritans. And now we've picked up Gentiles. And this is going to be a big deal when it comes to Acts 15. Peter's going to say the same thing in Acts 15. At the, you know, the first, the first church conference in Acts 15. Then we get to the dispersed disciples of John the Baptist it, at Ephesus. In Acts 19, 1 through 7, I'm reading verse 6. And when Paul, who was on his third missionary trip, had laid his hands upon them, which shows apostolic authority, that's been established. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. What's interesting, this group, this group are, are Jews, dispersed Jews in uh, Ephesus, and they're picked up. You see, it's just, and what is all of this called? It's called Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And you can see, come, and, and what Joel called it was the pouring out. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit, of uh, Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Now, in closing, Joel referred to it as pouring out. I don't, I don't know that I wrote that, but E.K., C-H-E-O, the pouring out from, the pouring out from. Joel refers to it as the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. He talks about it in Joel 2.28, and we read about it in Acts 2.17. It's also discussed to come with the second coming of Christ, in Isaiah 44, 3. In Acts 10, 45. I mean, Acts 10, 45. All the circumcised believers, that's Jewish age, that's Jews of the Jewish age. All circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. We, and we just read that, didn't we? And it was connected with Jesus' baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Agreed? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And what was this to do? It was to incorporate all the different believers out of the Jewish age into one body of New Testament church age believers like Galatians 327 neither neither Jew nor Gentile male or female slave or bond business Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit now now pay attention to me I was going to make this a point five but because I think it's important but I didn't have enough for, so I just attached it. But this is really a big deal. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit, now listen to me, is the first official act of Jesus seated at the right hand of God the Father, or what we call in session, where he has absolute authority. Are you with me? Listen to Acts 2.33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, see, we call that session, ascension session, and having, well, watch this now, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. See, we're in, we're, the job is about to get done, which is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. He has poured forth, hello, this which you both see in here. Man, I, I don't know if it could get clearer than that. If it, if it can get clearer, I can't get it. One of the interesting reads for you is this idea became part of the Apostle Creed or decree in the, out of the church conference. I want, so I've got the time. I put, a, I put it there to say, 
you're going to have, say, I actually thought it would take longer for me to get where I was. And probably if I had done a little more research on this, I could have. Sometimes I go quick and sometimes I don't. I don't know how all that works. I will learn it after 40 more years in the ministry. Um, well, huh? You'll be there? Now, okay. I love that idea. You and I will be somewhere 40 years from now, won't we? And we'll be together. I can tell you that, buddy. Uh, listen to verse. I'm in Acts 15. I'm at the, I'm at the church conference. This is a big, this is a big deal. And, and listen, you know what the church conference says to me? The church is well established. Now, this is between Paul's first and second trip, and the church is well established. The church, the new covenant church is well established. Now, they got problems, but what church doesn't? Um, mine. I don't have any. Certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise the, the them, Gentiles, and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The, this is the reason I suppose the book of Hebrew was written. <laughs> Uh, because of that idea. And the apostles and the elders of the Jerusalem church came together, that's apostolic authority, came together to look into the matter. This is when the matter matters. And after there had been much debate, would you, would you like to have been a fly in a wall on that idea? Much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, and that by my, my mouth, that's Genesis 10 and 11, I mean um, Acts 10 and 11, and by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That, that's Acts 10 and 11. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their heart by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put, to God, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the necks of the disciples a yoke that is Moses' law? He just said that. Disciples of the yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. It was the law was never for you to bear. It was to show you couldn't and point you to Christ who was your redeemer. You see, that's Galatians, the third chapter. But we believe that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also. And all the multitudes kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them to the Gentiles. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simon has related how God first concerned himself about, about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as written, and he goes on and gives prophetic utterance of the scriptures. Okay? So... Acts uh, 10 and 11. That's the whole Gentile collection. In other words, 10 and 11 talk about the same thing from two different. Yeah, yeah. The picking up the Gentiles come out of 10 and 11. And that's what they're talking about. Chapter 10 and 11, you pick up all the information. Well, thank you for coming, people. Let's have a closing word of prayer. And we shall go home. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these who have come our way tonight by automobile and by internet. And we pray, Father, that they would understand that it takes more than one hearing. 
to get over the debating and the conflict and all that kind of stuff, to be able to go back and let the Holy Spirit explain things to them. I know I went through, but this, we've been talking about this for weeks. We have built ourselves up to this place. So somebody who might drop in today, you need to go back and look at our Tuesday night studies on the baptisms of Jesus and do much more in-depth study. But in this study, if you will go back and pay attention and under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit study it, I think you will find some divine revelation in there that would be important to your spiritual growth momentum. We live in the church age under the new covenant. We live in the day when the church is the divine agency, the custodian of the word of God and evangelism, and we are it. We are the church. It's not brick and mortar. It's bone and flesh. Born again by the grace of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ that declares that we are all sinners. Not because we sin, but because we're born under Adam's sin. Romans, the fifth chapter. And Christ came to take away that sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was buried and on the third day raised from the dead to show us that not only did he win over sin, but he won over death because sin and death both come from the Adamic sin of Genesis 2.17. We are thankful for that. We are thankful, Father, to have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, not of ourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. We are thankful for that. We're thankful to be part of the New Covenant Church, and our responsibility is to carry the message of the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth, and we pray would be a part of that movement of God in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.